you are now listening to a talking moving picture whose synchronism is not only perfect but foolproof. In April 1923, the first sound movies were exhibited in major theaters. They were listed as added attractions to the established silent film programs. And this extra bonus gave audiences a variety of material consisting of short subjects, featurettes, and newsreels, all with the added element of sound. Taxes take from everyone a part of his earnings and force everyone to work for a certain part of his time for the government. I have two tickets to the Ma Opera House, and we're going to hear Gallicurchi. Gallicurchi? Who's he? Gallicurchi, who's he? Gallicurchi, the violinist. That's where they sing opera, the Metropolitan Opera House. Yeah. Oh, no, no, lady. No, you're wrong. I'm not Tommy Meehan. Although regarded as a novelty, these early talkies featured public figures as well as many of the major stars of vaudeville. This gave theater audiences the chance to not only see, but hear for the first time these great personalities as if they were attending a live performance. At the same time, these famous performers who appeared before the sound cameras became immortalized by this new medium of talking pictures. A medium that did not produce sound from phonograph records. These films used a system which recorded sound directly onto the film itself and is the same basic process still used today. This program represents just a small portion of the thousands of films produced through the pioneering work of the brilliant 20th century American scientist and inventor, Dr. Lee DeForest, who truly gave the world its first sound of movies. The idea of pictures with sound evolved almost from the earliest silent motion pictures. As early phonographs became a part of home entertainment, Thomas Edison never ceased to dream of combining his phonograph with the motion picture. After a number of failed attempts, he was convinced that synchronization of phonograph records and motion pictures had no commercial future. But hundreds of others around the world continued the search, all hoping to one day make the marriage of picture and sound a reality. The problem was that they all pursued methods based on mechanical principles. These devices not only looked alike, but had the same technical problems. The sounds they produced were harsh, tinny, or squawky. Words were often distorted or hard to understand. But most of all, they were impractical because they could not be heard in a theater. In 1899, the new field of wireless intrigued De Forest, who was then in his mid-twenties. As a young scientist, he was determined to find a type of receiver which would respond to high-frequency electrical waves. This led him to a new idea of wireless telephone called radio. By 1904, De Forest established high-speed telegraph communication between Wales, England, and Ireland. And with the impending conflict between Russia and Japan, De Forest believed wireless service would be a valuable communications tool. As a result, the whole story of the Russo-Japanese Naval War was reported by the DeForest Wireless Service to news organizations around the world. This coverage earned DeForest the reputation of delivering what is now termed spot news, and he was now cited as 
the wireless wizard. A patent was issued to DeForest in 1907 for his invention of the three electrode electron vacuum tube amplifier. This highly valuable invention placed him in the ranks of Alexander Graham Bell in the telephone, Thomas Edison's incandescent lamp, and rendered Guillermo Marconi's wireless a useless commodity. Yet the name of DeForest is least known for his amplifier device, which became the foundation of all mass communications and the backbone of our technological civilization. Edison remarked, in the Audion, De Forest invented a device which amplifies sound so much that if a fly were to walk across a transmitter, the noise at the receiver end would shatter your eardrum. The purpose of this test is to demonstrate that this method and apparatus is entirely operative. This record is made with a light source consisting of a glass tube filled with nitrogen gas using as electrodes two small tungsten balls separated by one half millimeter and supplied with high frequency alternating current. By 1920, DeForest staged a demonstration of his working prototypes for the U.S. Patent Office using his specially designed playback equipment. It synchronizes the voice with lip movement. I shall now pronounce the word pyrotechnic. Genuine talking pictures had finally arrived, and DeForest was determined to interest film industry leaders that his sound on film system would revolutionize motion picture entertainment. After several more demonstrations, DeForest announced that he fully intended to put an end to silent pictures. This cavalier statement made industry leaders nervous. Not only did they resist the arrival of new devices, they feared that DeForest intended to put them out of business if they did not adopt his sound on film system. This assumption was far from the true. But if the industry had made its move, the sound revolution would have begun in 1925. In spite of the obvious value of sound, the moguls stubbornly failed to see the commercial potential and simply pretended that the forest didn't exist. They were content with the profits being made from silent films. And in their blind faith, they smugly remarked, the public does not want pictures that talk. But de Forest had faith. In 1922, he became his own producer and set up studio operations in New York City. On 48th Street, and there he, there he did some of his early experimental work in sound motion pictures. That is, we had motion pictures, but, we, but, uh, but there was no sound to it. And he developed a method whereby you could photograph sound on the, on the, on the film. Not another word from you, Mrs. Smith. Oh, police! Oh. No, you. You've been your mother's blooming echo for the last 20 years. Another word from you, my girl, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a good idea. Oh, you fool! You cruel, wicked man! But the major studios controlled most of the theaters and did not wish to promote a competing product. This forced De Forest to seek out maverick theater owners willing to take a chance on this new technology. De Forest got his first break from Dr. Hugo Riesenfeld, who managed the Rivoli, Rialto, and Strand theaters. Riesenfeld was far-sighted enough to understand the importance of DeForest's invention and showcased the phonofilm productions as a regular part of his silent film programs. By 1925, DeForest phonofilms were seen in 34 theaters along the Atlantic seaboard, extending as far south as Florida and as far west as Cleveland. Just as the major studio shunned DeForest's invention, they refused to make their stars available for his sound cameras. So DeForest turned to Broadway and persuaded several headline performers to work for little or no compensation, just for the chance of being immortalized in this new medium of talking pictures.
Hey, hey, uh, all your horses. Bye. I want to totally the studio. The fellow what gets the money wins the game. Well, that you hit me now. Uh-huh. Now back up now, back up. Well, well, who made it up? You should be the first. <laughs> Well, I suggested the game. Well, I don't accept your suggestions. You don't want my suggestion. I should be the foisters. Well, I won't have you will choose for it. Tell, tell. You're tell. always kicking and hollering and fighting graciously. I win the draft. Here, here, here. What did you win? You didn't win anything. No. You shoot first, that is all. Oh, I'm the foisters. Hey, don't, don't worry about the money. I'll take care of that. <laughs> Not if I uh, know it. Back, 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 back. You, you've got to keep away three feet from the table. Three feet? Yes, sir. Well, when I'm close up, I'm three feet away. Well, that's your misfortune. I can... Ah, back, I can... Here, here. Put the no, ball no, down no, here. Put, it up put there. the ball down no, here. No, no, leave it there. I want to hit them. You must always commence from the pimple. You see the pimple here? That's the pimple here. Pimple, yes. Stop oh, from there. it's going to be a fight. Keep your seat. Oh, I'm not worried. Don't worry, man. Uh -huh. Now, remember. What? you got to bust the balls before you break them. Oh, you got to break them before you bust them. Exactly. I'm going to give them a good connect. Well, give them that. Give them here. <laughs> Oh, you silly, you. What? You must always shoot with the end, but the sponge is on, you see. That's a sponge? That's a sponge, yes. Now, that's very tight. Well, it's made from rope. You can't help that now. Uh -huh. Now, now, are you ready? Sure. Now, what are you playing? Huh? What are you playing? Pool, ain't it? You... Of course you're playing pool, but, but, but what ball are you playing? Oh, you got to play a ball? Don't you understand? Not yet. There are 15 balls on the table. Uh -huh. And every ball has got a number on it. Yeah. You have got to call out one certain number to go into a certain pocket. Uh -huh. If any other ball goes in, then I get it. Remember that now. You get it? Yes, sir. No, well, what do I get? Bad luck. Yeah, yeah. Bad, well, it's all right. Hey, here, here. Uh, what? what ball you play? I play the round one. The round one? Yeah. What's the matter with you? Them is all round. But this one is rounder than the others. I like to see myself. That looks like What's the matter with you? I didn't agree with you now. I leave the balls alone. I will if I like. I give you one, you'll be murdered if you don't break the table. I don't push. Shut down, you. I give it to you. You keep away from here. You can't make me. I'm telling you, keep away from the table. I'll tell you, tell you. Now you see what's going to happen if you don't now. You're going to happen. You leave the balls alone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bluffy number one. Bluffy number two, you can say bluff. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. left my sleeve off at you. You, la you laughed the wrong way yeah. if you keep on talking, I'm telling yeah. you. Yeah, I'm afraid of you, you ain't I? You bet you're afraid, you see? Yeah, I'm running, standing still. You, you run, you, you, you keep on talking, you see what's gonna happen now. Uh, you're gonna keep on talking. Well, you keep it up, that's all I'm telling you now. Yeah. 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 You go and sit down. I ain't tired. Well, I'll make you tired, I'll, I'll make you good and tired. Oh, you did. You be so tired, you're gonna fall down, that's what you're gonna do. You fall down with you, you keep up on it, you see? Oh, yeah. I, I, I tell you now, you keep it up. I will if I like. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hope you don't get it. I hope I do get it. I hope you don't get it. I hope I do get it. Well, I hope you don't get it. Well, I hope I do get it. Well, I hope my hope comes out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, I'll do the jail for you. You see what I'm saying? In the jail, that wouldn't make your account. You have to you. You take the whole pleasure from the game with yeah, your heart yeah, and sure. you. Yeah. You, you. You see now? I see, yeah. You, you see it? Yeah. yeah. I, I, in the jail, I'll go for you. Yeah, I'm going to bring you cigars. I don't want you cigars. I don't want anything from you. Yeah. You just keep quiet, that's all. I keep quiet if I like. You, you like now. Yeah, I hope you miss it. You hope I miss it, yeah. Yeah.
country needs every ounce of its energy to restore itself. The costs of government are all assessed upon the people. This means that there is doomed to provide a certain amount of money out of the sale of his produce, no matter how low the price to pay his taxes. The manufacturer, the professional man, 
the clerk must do the same from their income. The wage earner, often at a higher rate when compared with his earning, makes his contribution perhaps not directly, but indirectly in the advanced cost of everything he buys. The expenses of the government reach everybody. Taxes take from everyone a part of his earnings and force everyone to work for a certain part of his time for the government. When we come to realize that the yearly expenses of the governments of this country have reached the stupendous sum of about $7,500,000,000, we get some idea of what this means. Of this amount, about $3,500,000,000 is needed by the national government and the remainder by local governments. Such a sum is difficult to comprehend. It represents all the pay of five million wage earners receiving five dollars a day, working 300 days in the year. If the government should add 100 million dollars of expense, it would represent four days more work of these wage earners. These are some of the reasons why I want to cut down public expense. I want the people of America to be able to work less for the government and more for themselves. I want them to have the rewards of their own industry. This is the chief meaning of freedom. Until we can reestablish a condition under which the earnings of the people can be kept by the people, we are bound to suffer a very severe and distinct curtailment of our liberty. These results are not fanciful. They are not imaginary. They are grimly actual and real, reaching into every household in the land. They take from each home annually an average of over $300, and taxes must be paid. They are not a voluntary contribution to be met out of surplus earnings. They are a stern necessity. They come first. It is only out of what is left after they are paid that the necessities of food, clothing, and shelter can be provided and the comforts of home secured are the yearnings of the soul for a broader and more abundant life gratified. When the government effects a new economy, it grants everybody a life pension with which to raise the standard of existence. It increases the value of everybody's property and raises the scale of everybody's wages. One of the greatest favors that can be bestowed upon the American people is economy in government. You really ought, all of you, to have come to the place from which I am now addressing you, and that is Malvern, quite the best bit of England because we have made a theater in Malvern, practically a new theater, all for your accommodation. And uh, we are going to do a number of plays, uh, which are all written by me, I may say, and therefore they're not uh, the old sort of play uh, that makes you, uh, persuades you to laugh when you are not really amused and which persuades you to feel very emotional when there's really nothing the matter. And my plays are all in the business of providing the new minds and the new souls. That is our business. Uh, you will have to come to the theater quite early at about the clock and you'll have to stay there very late. It will be a tremendously long business and you'll suffer a great deal in the process. But it will be, on the whole, you will go away feeling that you have had your money's worth. How do you do, my good people? They sent me out here to talk to the mic. 
I didn't know it was going to be an Irish party. This is station COD. SAP announcing. 398 meters marked down from 400. The first is the stock market reports. Broker Goldstein was very sick. He had a fever of 102. Levi said when it gets to 104, he should sell. Public school talk. Public school number 56 learns a new study called Gazinte. Who goes into four? Four goes into eight. Father goes into lots of places and comes home very late. Mother goes into hysterics and then goes into bed. But what goes into corned beef hash, I can't get into my head. I will now speak on the 18th Amendment. That's the only subject that I, that's all that. The history of the United States. First the Indians settled here. Then came the Dutch and settled the Indians. Then came the Irish and settled the Dutch. Then came the Hebrews and settled the Irish. Then came provision, that settled everything. Say, where would our forefathers be if they had provision in those days? Where could they get the spirits of 1776? Could Washington cross the Brandywine? Paul Revere have his pony? And I ask you, could the Statue of Liberty be lit up every night? My friends, they say whiskey is the root of all evil. So I move we adjourn the Ginsburg cellar and get right down to the root. Only last week I saw a man sell his wife for a glass of whiskey. I saw him he was crying. I said, what's the matter? He said, I wish I had my wife back again. I said, are you sorry? He said, no, I'm thirsty. I will now sing a little ballad for you dedicated to my wife entitled, There'll Never Be Another Like You. Thank God. All right, Professor. If all I need the paper in, and father said it was a waste, to call the paper hangers in, so he then got some paste. He got some rolls of paper, a ladder and a brush, and with my mother's nightgown on, at it he made a rush. Then father papered the parlor, you couldn't see father for paste. He was dabbing it here, he was dabbing it there, there was paper and paste flying everywhere. Nathan was stuck to the ceiling, the kids were stuck to the floor. You never saw so many Jewish people so stuck up before. Huh. Pardon me a minute, I just felt my pencil backfiring, so I gotta go out and lubricate. I'll see you a little later. Thank you. I deserve it. <clears throat> I bet you feel I was all through. No such luck. I must finish this. Oh, before I forget, uh, yesterday I went down to the Pennsylvania Railroad Station to wait for a train from Philadelphia. And standing alongside of me, uh, right in the little place where you make the trains for Philadelphia, was a Jewish man and a little boy. And it seems that this boy must have aggravated his father because his father kept hitting him. He kept saying to him, I could give it to you for the second time. Finally, a man passed and said, cut it out, mister. Don't you hit that boy again or I'll make trouble for you. Hear that? I'll make trouble for you. This fellow turned around and said, you're going to make trouble for me. Last week, my wife ran away with the janitor. Yesterday, I failed in business. My baby's got measles and he swallowed the tickets to Philadelphia and you're going to make trouble for me? You seem to like this story so well, I think I'll tell you another story of a gentleman of Hebraic faith. Last uh, year, uh, the week before Christmas, you remember we had the week before Christmas last year, I was going on the train from Chicago to San Francisco on the Overland Limited. That's an express train that goes directly from Chicago to San Francisco. And the first day out, seated alongside of me, was this little fellow kept moaning to himself like this. Oh, oh. And the next day out, he repeated the same thing. He says, oh, basement. And when he did it the third day, I went over to him. I said, Mister, please excuse me for butting in, but I want to help you. Tell me why. Why do you keep moaning like that? He says, Oh, it's already the third day I'm on the wrong train. Uh, well, I think I'll sing again now. It won't hurt. Mr. Olson, again, won't you play a little something, Freddy? <laughs> George 
Porgy. Porgy is a guy who is very bashful and so shy. The ladies prize him. They idolize him. You can find him most anywhere in a great big cozy Morris chair. I'd be looking at the ceiling while some girly is appealing. Oh, gee, Georgie, whenever I'm with you. Oh, gee, Georgie, I don't know what to do. You never tease or hug or squeeze like Johnny or Joe. You look at me and then, oh, gee, I get so, I don't know. Oh, gee, Georgie, what can it be? When you're around, I get so excited. You're not handsome like a statue, but each time that I look at you, oh, gee, Georgie, oh, gee. Oh, gee, Georgie, whenever I'm with you. Oh, gee, Georgie, I don't know what to do. You talk to me of poetry and music and art, but you're not here for that, my dear. I wish you'd start. Have a heart. Oh, gee, Georgie, what can it be? When you're around, I get so excited. My head should be just where your chest is. Kiss me hot lips, I'm as best as Oh, gee, Georgie, oh, gee. The reason they call me the miracle woman of the century is I am the only woman in captivity who will admit her real age. Now, I was crossing over from London to Paris a few uh, months ago, and uh, General Pershing was with us, and uh, I happened to ask the general what he thought of aviation, and if he'd ever been up in an aeroplane. He said, no, it was not perfected, and he was afraid to go. Well, then I said that I had crossed once, and oh, what a dreadful trip I had. And when I finished, he said, well, Fanny, that certainly was a terrible trip. But he said, how would you have liked to have come over in that small boat with Columbus? I said, I did. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Is that you again? Didn't I tell you not to call me? Oh. All my life I've known you. And now? Well, now I'm going to disown you. No. There'll be no regret. Ha! I'll just forget. Yes. Well, there's one resolution that I'll make and keep. Now, I'll never think of you. And we'll never meet. No. I don't care where you go or what you do. Don't you dare come near my street. That'll fix you my home. Turn right around. Walk right out. I just found out what it's all about. And I've got no time for you. Father's time. For no time. I'm no more worried. And no more cares. All day long, I'm just walking on air. Since I've stopped thinking of you, Father Time, it's about time, please tell me. Why should I sit and sigh for hours and honey by? I'm having a wonderful time. There's no one to criticize, and don't you be a bit surprised. If I take an aeroplane because I've got a fighty brain, when time flies, it's always non-stop. But I'm too fly for you, old pup. That's why I'll say goodbye to you, Father Time. For all of the time, I'll say goodbye forever. For you and I can never, never be the same old friend. Nineteen twenty four was a pivotal year for De Forest when he was teamed with animation pioneer Max Fleischer. The result was the famous sing along films that used a bouncing ball to help theater audiences to follow the beat. And join in everybody. Has anybody here?
the jazz singer was uh, shown on Broadway. This was recorded on a disc, and the disc had to be synchronized with the film. So it was dependent upon the control man up in the control room, the projectionist booth, who was smart enough to be able to synchronize that sound with the film. DeForest's sound on film process was the most practical. As sound became inevitable, the studios made a mad rush to produce talking pictures no matter what system was used. In the process, they took all the credit for launching the talkies and pretended that Lee DeForest never existed. In 1926, William Fox joined forces with communications giant Western Electric to produce the Fox Movie Tone newsreel using a process that was in violation of DeForest's patents. As Fox went full speed into sound newsreel production, DeForest saw all his years of hard work disintegrate before his eyes. Knowing what he was up against, he decided that he must fight the forces that had shut him out and destroyed his life's work. He filed suit. In 1924, we had 36 theaters installed. And when a theater would exhaust our supply of phonofilm, we would take the equipment out and put it in another theater. In July or, or June 1927, we made an installation in the Capitol Theater to show the Lindbergh pictures. His arrival in Washington made the preceding day, and those pictures ran for three weeks. My company was out of funds and unable to make further pictures. And without sound pictures, the theater owners had no use for the equipment. It was not until Fox began to make movie tone pictures and release them in 1927 that there was any available pictures, sound on film, after we made the Lindbergh picture. And the people of Europe... Since lawyers and judges had no understanding of sound technology, they were easily influenced in the discrediting of DeForest by a simple alteration of his own working principles. During photography and projection, Film is stopped and started at the lens. This interrupted movement makes direct alignment of picture and sound impossible to record or play back. So DeForest added his sound pickup head above the lens. Using a loop that ran on a flywheel, he maintained a constant flow. As the film continued down to the lens, the distance from the image and corresponding sound impulse was approximately 20 frames behind. DeForest discovered that he could record intelligible sound at 20 frames per second. The sound equipment used in the trial was manufactured by Western Electric, with the sound pickup head mounted below the lens, the same distance as in DeForest's invention. This placed the soundtrack ahead of the image. But most importantly, Western Electric engineers raised the projection standard to 24 frames per second with the full knowledge of DeForest's 20-frame rate. So when DeForest's films were played in court, they not only appeared out of synchronization, but the voices sounded ridiculously high-pitched. Why DeForest was not allowed to show his films on his own equipment remains a mystery. Litigation continued for eight years. Finally, in 1935, the federal court upheld all of DeForest's claims. And the U.S. District Judge declared that DeForest now owned and held exclusive rights under each of his basic patents in sound recording and reproduction. This was a triumph of the little guy winning over the corporate giant. But the battle exhausted all of DeForest's assets, and he never profited from his work in sound films. Because of corporate propaganda and industrial espionage, his place in the development of the talkies was obscured for decades. But his technological successes proved most satisfying to him. True to form, DeForest went on to apply his genius to the emerging field of television, while his pioneering work in sound motion pictures was forgotten for 20 years. The situation was different in 1959 when DeForest received an honorary Academy Award for his 
pioneering inventions which brought sound to the motion picture. Most of his opponents who had obscured him in the past were no longer around. By this time, very few knew about DeForest's achievements. Most of all, no one knew of the existence of any of the original DeForest phonofilm productions. Yet the industry finally deemed it necessary to give credit to DeForest 40 years later. So what does this mean to the entire industry and its history? We know that George Eastman is credited with making the physical motion picture from plastic strips. We know that Thomas Edison reportedly invented the machine that made the motion picture work. And because of his vision, faith, and perseverance, Lee DeForest made the marriage of sound and film a success. And the phonofilms are the surviving evidence of DeForest's place as the true originator of the modern talking picture. Him, 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 him
Tommy Meehan. Funny how everybody takes me for Tommy Meehan. No, Tommy hasn't got that certain, uh, you know, that I have. But uh, it's a funny thing. For a man that's good looking as I am, I get the homeliest girl. I just canceled the girl of mine, yes. Homely? Oh, you've heard about people's faces being wrinkled? Hus was a court eater. And, and she had a very, very nice family. Of course, they had a lot of hard luck. Yes, her, her poor father. Uh, he died of throat trouble. They hung him. And her brother, lovely chap, but he's gone, poor fella. With good behavior, he ought to be out in uh, 1927 or 8. You know, he used to work in a bank. But no matter how much the boss likes you, you can't work in a bank and bring home samples. Oh, no. And she was a nice girl. I didn't mind her being homely, but she was so dumb, terribly dumb. Well, she was so dumb, they had to burn down the schoolhouse to get her out of the second grade. Can't beat that. Well, enough about her. I think I'll recite. That's it. I feel poetical. There was a man who loved the bees. He was their earnest friend. He used to sit upon their hives, but they stung him in the end. <laughs> Thank you. I knew you'd like it. Now I think I'll sing. It's the safest thing for me to do. Mr. Olson, would you play something for Eddie? Do that, will you? I may look simple, but I want you to... I'm full of knowledge. I'm right at home with brainy men, and then my wisdom I show. But when there's clever girls around, I get up and go. Those educated babies are a bore. I'm going to say what I've said many times before. Oh, the dumber they come, the better I like them, cause the dumb ones know how to make love. A oh, Weisenheimer has you meet her folks when you call. The brainless baby always keeps you down in the hall. Oh, the dumbbells I've met have won beauty prizes. They look like angels sent from above. A clever girl will want to know if you mean to wed. The dumb ones never think of looking that far ahead. And by the dumber they come, the better I like them, cause the dumb ones know how to make love. Oh, the dumber they come, the better I like them, cause the dumb ones know how to make love. The smart girls speak Greek and other languages too, but the dumb girls only languages who's putchy putchy as you. All the sets that I've met have won beauty prizes, they look like angels sent from above. You start on squeezing clever girls, you're soon on the shelf. But when you're with dumb doors, you can just be yourself. All the dumb ones they come, the better I like them.
Are you there? Oh, yes. Are you at the bank? Yes. I want to see the manager, please. I say I want to see the manager. You say this is a tele, not a telescope, but a telephone. Well, you're very bright this morning, ain't it? So do me a favor. Hang a small piece of crepe on your nose. Your brain is dead. And if I have any more importance than you, I'll speak to the manager about you. I said, oh, I'm sick. Oh, you are the manager. I beg your pardon. I'm much obliged. I called you up to tell you that I'm your tenant, Cohn. No, I ain't going. I'm stopping here. I say I'm your tenant, Cohen. No, not Lieutenant Cohen. I want to tell you that last night the wind came and blew down the shutter outside my house. I say, the wind, the wind, not the devil, the wind. You know, that makes life like that. Yes, that's it. The last night the wind blew down the shutter. I didn't tell you to shut up. I said, hello, are you there? I said, last night the wind came and blew down the shutter. No, not a tremendous shutter. A shutter. The thing that goes down in front from the house. I, uh, hello, are you, are you there? Hello. I said, last night the wind. The wind came and blew down the shutter outside my house. And I want you to send the carpenter. I say, I want you to send the carpenter. You know, one of those fellas that hit the hammer and hit the nails. Yes. Yeah. Well, hello, are you there? Last night, the wind came and blew down the shutter outside my house. The shutter, the thing that comes down in front from the show. Hello, are you there? The last night, the wind came and blew down the shutter outside my house. And I want you to send the carpenter. A carpenter. One of those fellas that hit the hammer mitten air. Yeah, a carpenter, that's right. I want you to send a carpenter to men the damage shutter. Two men. No, no, not two men. One man. Two men the damage shutter. Hello, are you there? Last night the wind came and blew down the shutter outside my house. And I want you to send a man to men the dam I'm not staring at you, I am telling you. Hello, are you there? Last night the wind came and blew down the shutter outside my house. And I want you to send a carpenter. A carpenter. Ah, never mind, I'll have it. In 1974, the United States Postal Service issued a commemorative stamp hailing the progress in electronics made by the late Dr. Lee DeForest and his Audion tube, which not only made sound motion pictures possible, but was the major component in broadcasting, long distance telephone service, stereo systems, and countless other modern day electronic miracles. This is the classic story of big business reaping the benefits while the true originator is forgotten. But as DeForest once said, the riches were theirs, but the honors were mine. This is Lee DeForest speaking into the microphone. That's all. Gonna fly all over God's head.